Hello, and welcome to A Slippery Deck, deck construction under the 2012 International Swimming Pool and Spa Code. This class is provided to you compliments of buildingcodecollege.com. Go beyond the words. Building Code College is an ICC-approved education provider and provides discounted enrollment to ICC members. We are also proud supporters of the North American Deck and Railing Association and also offer discounted enrollment to our deck education courses. So the International Code Council, this is an organization that creates model codes that are adopted most widely across our country. They have a huge family of codes. These range from energy to mechanical, electrical, building, existing, property, on and on. Many codes that provide construction standards for our built environment. A new one came out in 2012, the International Swimming Pool and Spa Code. And this code regulates not only the pools, but decks and walking surfaces that are around pools and spas like these. The first provision we're going to talk about today is 306.7, Deck Edges. It states, the edges of all decks shall be radiused, tapered, or otherwise designed to eliminate sharp corners. Radiused and tapered is pretty definitive and easy to understand, but designed to eliminate sharp corners. That can become difficult in standardized code. Imagine a speed limit sign, 35 miles an hour, very easy to recognize, define, and everyone can be sure they're within that limit. But imagine if it was slow or otherwise capable to eliminate auto accidents. Code written in this manner is much more difficult for the contractor and the inspectors. Let's look at this deck. Are these corners acceptable? Do they just need to be rounded over? What about the ones on the other side of this stairway? Are these outside of harm's way from the spa? There's another deck that has some sharp corners around. These have been rounded over with the router, so they'll probably be covered under the radius, though I still wouldn't want to slip and hit my head on those. Another provision is 306.5, gaps. It says gaps shall be provided between deck boards in wood and wood plastic composite decks. Hmm, that's pretty clear. Gaps between the adjacent deck boards. This is going to be a problem for tongue and groove decking. There's a number of manufacturers on the market that provide quality products with a tongue and groove profile. Those aren't gaps between the decking. Perhaps this code should read more clearly about some means of drainage or drainage gaps or drainage holes as opposed to clearly stating gaps between deck boards. Another section is 306.4, sloped stating, decks shall be sloped so that standing water will not be deeper than 1 8 inch 20 minutes after the cessation of the addition of water to the deck. Hmm, decks shall be sloped is easy to understand, but providing a code limitation that takes a period of time to watch the performance is a little difficult. Imagine that speed limit sign stating that you cannot go faster than such that speed upon which applying the brakes on the vehicle will stop you within 15 feet. Not something that's easy to really understand. Are you within the limits or outside of the limits? However, this section goes on to provide more clear understanding, stating that there is a minimum slope of one eighth of an inch and a maximum slope of one quarter of an inch. And this is over a one foot distance. That's easier to understand than the 20 minutes that the water is supposed to drain off the deck. I mean, if you look at a nicely waxed wood, uh, Brazilian hardwood deck like this one, the ponding water, even with drainage gaps, could be upwards of one eighth of an inch. But being sloped might not be so easy. What about this deck? Does that entire lower deck need to be sloped or just the portion around the spa? What if the deck was built in years past but the jurisdiction has now adopted this code. There's no provision or exception for existing conditions like this. Previous decks were likely built level, and new spas put adjacent to them wouldn't really be covered by this code. Or what about situations like this, with uh, two levels and stairs? Do all of these components need to be out of level, or do they just need to drain the water off? Currently, they need to do both. 
Another section, 306.2, slip resistant. It states that decks, ramps, coping, and similar step surfaces shall be slip resistant and cleanable. Special features on, in or on decks, such as markers, brand insignias, and similar materials shall be slip resistant. So what's slip resistant mean? And how do we find that limitation to be certain we are either or we aren't slip resistant? Well, the code does provide a definition. The definition states, a surface that has been so treated or constructed to significantly reduce the chance of a user slipping. The surface shall not be an abrasive hazard. Hmm, let's try to figure this one out. I mean, it's clear that it can't be an abrasive hazard, so we can't cover the deck in grip tape like a skateboard. Probably not an attractive option anyway. But what about this deck? Here's a, just a composite decking material. Has it been treated to reduce slipping? Has it been constructed significant, specifically in a manner to significantly reduce slipping? If you look online for slip-resistant decks, you find some methods that are clearly intended to provide significant slip resistance, either grooved deck boards like to the bottom right, or ones that actually have abrasive strips inlaid into them. The one in the upper right has grooves and angles cut across in many directions, those curves providing more traction to the walker. So what is slip resistance, and how are we going to find this out? Currently, it's probably going to be up to the inspector to decide if your deck is slip resistant or not. Now, in the 2012 and 2009 International Residential Code, the code references ASTM D7032 for composite wooden plastic composite decking. If we look at that standard here, we can see that D7032 has this section, 5.6, and it's a slip resistant test says when required, the slip resistant, the coefficient of friction, shall be determined in accordance with test method F1679. So let's go down this rabbit trail and look for F1679. Here it is, and here's our standard 1679. Oh, this is the standard test method for using a variable incidence trabometer. You guys have seen those before, right? I've got one under my kitchen sink. <laughs> No, seriously though, let's go back and look at the test standard. Down in the bottom corner, we see this. I'll blow it up so we can look at it. It is the responsibility of the user of this standard to establish appropriate safety and health practices and determine the applicability of regulatory limitations prior to use. Determine the applicability of regulatory limitations. What does this mean to us? Well. It tells us that there is a standard for testing slip resistance, but there's not a standard or a value that sets a limit to what is slip resistant or what's not. Again, it's back to the inspector, and he doesn't really want that responsibility to make that call either. So let's look at some final notes. The code gets changed. It gets changed every three years. The 2012 plumbing co or, uh, International Swimming Pool and Spa Code we've just discussed will be changed in 2013. Often, it's not done from the perspective of the decking industry. As we can see here, there's a lot of thoughts that, that could be included in when it comes to the actual application of this code against new and existing decks. And then as I said, this code will already be argued from and modified for the 2015 edition next year in 2013. The North American Deck and Railing Association is working for the decking industry and will be involved with that modification process next year. Go to www.nadra.org to learn how you can support their efforts. My name is Glenn Mathewson, and I thank you for learning with me today.